Bringing you the rigs, the trucks, the laboratories, and offices, this is the Oil and Gas Contractors Connect podcast with your host, Ryan Ray. Welcome to another edition of the Oil and Gas Contractors Connect podcast. I am Ryan Ray, your host and the owner of R Square Global, and this is the show where you get to connect with other contractors. Be sure to connect with me on LinkedIn. We'll link to that in the show notes. You can search Ryan Ray or Ryan Ray Senior in LinkedIn. And also go check out our website at uh, R-Square Global, which is GoR2.com. That will be in the show notes as well. Today we have on a gentleman from the San Antonio, Texas area. Um, a fellow I've known for, God, I don't want to date us here, Chris, but it's, it's been probably half a decade now <laughs> since we've kind of first uh, crossed paths at an IRWA event. He is a surface land and right-of-way professional from the San Antonio, Texas area, Chris Fails. Chris, how's it going today, brother? Hey, it's going great. Thanks for having me on, Ryan. It's good to talk to you again. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I was excited when you uh, when you reached out to the day and mentioned you wanted to come on because uh, there's so many things that we do in the industry. And, you know, I was telling someone the other day, just, just a simple distinction between, you know, a right-of-way agent and a landman. And you get people who come into the business and obviously you can have some cross-pollination there, um, but not everyone is familiar with the maybe the historic distinctions there. So let's just kind of start maybe with that, with um, with a distinction between you know, you got you got a title like a landman, you got a title like a right-of-way agent. Um, obviously, some people do both, but um, let's just kind of set the table for what are those ty- what do those terms mean, and then where do you fit into that larger equation? Well, over the years. You know, used to a landman was a landman, but because the intricacies of the law and because of what goes into title has gotten so specific and it's narrowed over the years, we've gotten to a point now where literally there's a mineral track, a surface track, and a right-of-way track that people are gravitating themselves into specialization because how you look at the minerals and how you go about leasing nowadays with whenever you compare that to going out and just getting the pad for a location to drill a well is completely different. Uh, The title is different. The way you run the title is different. And what that ultimately ends up costing the company is very different too. So you want to be sure that you're running the right form of title, be it vesting title from whenever it was given in a patent to someone is what you need for mineral, but for service, mm-hmm. you need a 30 year title and that mm-hmm. makes a drastic difference in the cost. And then you even have to look further. Like I'm working on a project over in New Mexico now where they have what's called a surface owner protection act. And that completely changes the way you look at surface versus the way you look at minerals. And then of course, right away, you're looking more at a linear project, how things stack. And there's a lot of coordination where a landman isn't really working with the other departments they're focused on i need to get all of these leases in an area so we can make a unit and then it gets handed off where in right of way there has to be a constant communication with engineers and permitting and all of the other aspects because there are things that you can do with a landowner to reroute a pipeline that'll make it more palatable for the landowner but operationally it's going to raise the cost more than what it would cost you to just pay the landowner to lay it where it was originally designed. Or you could change the hydraulics of that pipeline, and that's where you have to have that coordination with engineering to be sure that any change that happens with that landowner on the right-of-way side doesn't change the hydraulics and everything that has gone into designing this pipeline. Right. Now, you mentioned there a minute ago, um, going back, different links for minerals versus um, surface. And obviously, like in Texas or in New Mexico or a lot of states, you know, you can go back, you know, a long, long time, depending on when those minerals were sold off. And, of course, somewhere like Louisiana, you only go back 10 years, um, depending on the case, because the law is a little bit different there. But you mentioned specifically for surface, 30 years. And so why don't, for someone who might not go, might not be into the surface um, right away business, why is 30 years kind of the standard for um, pulling title if you're going to lease, a, uh, not lease, um, get a right away for a pipeline? And it's it does vary a little bit state to state, but where I've worked in Texas, New Mexico, Louisiana, 30 years is considered what's called marketable title. And that is where judges, the case law, have said that you've done your due diligence to find all the proper owners once you've gone 30 years into the title. And it 
that's where I, it saves a lot of money because going it going all the way back to patent could lengthen the amount of time that you're spending on title three to four hundred percent. So if you can go to that thirty percent, there's case law out there that says you've properly done the due diligence to find the proper landowners, and if there's someone that is missed, you're you can walk in wearing the white hat and saying we did a thirty year marketable title run. We tried to find everyone. And it makes you look good whenever, if you ever end up in court over a title dispute. Right. Let's talk a little bit about title disputes. Um, not not necessarily the particulars of them, <laughs> um, but you know what? I was talking to uh, Lee Dinky for an interview early, earlier today, and one of the things I said is, you know, um, when we're doing like a survey project, um, and, and you'll be familiar with this, Chris, because you buy this right away that we're talking about. Is we come across uh, a property and we'll cross two tracks, and it's like, you know what? We're gonna go ahead and double pay because. We're not sure if it's the fence. We're not sure if it's a property line, um, but but the judge could rule either way, and so we just want to go ahead and double pay for this this little segment of pipe here, just to protect you. What are some things that you see as a right of way agent that maybe when you go into a client's office or you start, you know, you start a project, you go, you know what, we really need to make sure that we're looking for X when we're negotiating our contracts or we're looking for title. Things that that they seem kind of obvious once you say them, but if you're not careful, a client or a vendor can overlook them. And that's really a good point because those are the things that at the beginning of the project, you can alert the client and alert the company. This is what we stand a chance of happening. There, there are areas where you're going to have a fence that doesn't match up with a property line. And there's different ways of handling that. Uh, there was one issue I ran into over in Louisiana where a timber company their deed referenced the section line as mm-hmm. the property line and the neighboring landowner, it referenced the fence as the property mm-hmm. line. Well, there was a 25 foot gap between the section line and the fence. So we ended up paying twice for that 25 feet of space. Mm-hmm. And then there was another project where I worked down in South Texas in Webb County, 90% of the time, the fences and the meets and bounds description of the track do not match. Mm-hmm. And so we've done, there were areas where it was such a wide gap, it didn't make financial sense to do that. So what we did is we went back and we did what's called a ad, ad, the David of adverse possession. And basically we got all the parties involved and you have to get disinterested parties to sign off as well saying that that fence has been there for X number of years, as long as it's over 17, you're good. And that everyone agrees that that is the property line. And then you can turn that over to the surveyors. You get the plats to show the fence as the property line. And you're able to keep, to avoid paying twice for the same stretch of land. Right. And you would see that in, as you mentioned, a situation where it's more than 25 feet. It's a, it's a significant difference. And, um, you know, it's cheaper, if you will, to get some kind of court ruling than it is to uh, to double pay. Um, so let's talk about dealing with landowners, um, particularly. So you know, obviously, in each state's different on uh, what you can do. You know, uh, kind of in condemnation is what we call it in Louisiana, but eminent domain, you know, is what, what common term. You know, the receptiveness of landowners to pipelines. Walk me through when you're getting ready to go on a project, um, kind of the mindset of how to approach landowners. Um, maybe your thoughts on, um, you know, should companies be very vocal in what they're looking to do? Or should they be kind of secret and quiet? Um, just kind of your process of, hey, we're going to do a 20 mile line, um, and these are the kind of things to go deal with the landowner that we need to be prepared the questions, the objections, things like that. Well, the number one thing is you want to be as open as you as you possibly can about the route and the reasoning, if there's any reasoning behind that route that you can share, because that's going to set kind of a precedent for how those landowners feel the day that a right away agent calls them to show up on a pipeline project. And then another thing that I've learned, I was at St. Mary's school law. I was part of the negotiation team. And one thing that we really harped on there was finding common ground and then trying to pull out from that landowner what is really truly important to them. The first thing I do before I ever call a landowner, before I ever make that first contact, I just get on the internet and I just research their name. You know, is this person a hunter? Are they an attorney or, you know, 
is there a golf tournament that shows them as a winner? So you can walk in and you open up the conversation talking about a deer hunt that we've been on or, you know, a golf course that they may have played that I've played. That, and it kind of breaks down that barrier because you find that common ground to start talking. And then the second thing is once you get in there and you get past that barrier, there's going to be some opposition from that landowner, I would say 80% of the time to the project. And you've got to figure out what is that opposition. Is this person truly financial driven and it's a matter of dollars and cents? Or is it because they're worried about a sight line that's going to be created whenever this pipeline crosses their property line from the road and they don't want the visualization? So a lot of times, maybe you're not talking about money. Money. Maybe you're talking about putting a berm right at the road where it avoids that sight line. Or if company's interested, put a dog leg into the pipeline so it doesn't create that visual line of sight into the property. It, you've got to find what, it's just a matter of finding out really what is important to that landowner so that you're not sitting here just, okay, well, let's go up on our offer $10. Let's go up on our offer $20 right. until they finally accept. Let's find out what's important to them because a lot of times it's not money. No, I think that's I think that's a great point. Some of the best right away agents I've come across. Um, first off, I think the best right away agents um, they've if they depending on how large your project is, you know, as goes Chris, sometimes you got a whole team of pulling title. But the right away agents who can actually pull and read and understand title um, on that kind of expert level kind of gives them it seems like a better feel for the property, if you will, of what's going on with the property because there could be other easements and things that you could find that. Um, you know, you might come across and say, oh, wow, Mr. Smith has had six property <laughs> right away has come across this property. He <laughs> might be very eager or he might be very tired. But the other thing is, is you mentioned creative solutions. Sometimes it feels like if you're not careful, you will get out there and you'll just try to bump the offer by $5, 10 $20, whatever the case may be, um, to get them to sign. In reality, there's other things that they're wanting. They may want a culvert put in or they may want, um, as you mentioned, these, these various things. And let's talk about now, the the client side on that uh, because um, I've been in meetings just like you have and sometimes clients are very open to that idea of yeah okay you know what we're not going to necessarily install the culvert because we don't want the liability but we'll pay for the culvert to be installed per se or you know or some of those things that you mentioned and sometimes they're not very receptive to that how do you deal with a client that maybe says you know what I'd just rather pay per rod price and not deal with this other stuff because that's not our business our business is putting pipelines in and we don't want to deal with that um, how much you try to persuade a client or advise a client, if you will, on the benefits of um, being more strategic in your negotiations? Well, you do run it. You do run the risk of a client being willing to say you rebuild somebody's fence because the fence along the pipeline is falling down and they want a new fence. You do run a risk of now you're liable for that fence. So five years later, that fence starts leaning. Now you're become liable for it, or you end up with a case where every time you go and you talk to the next landowner, they're like, hey, you built Betty a fence. I want you to build me a pond over here. Use some of the extra dirt you have to build me a dam. And next thing you know, your crews are doing more work out there on honeydew projects than they are on building a pipeline. I really do agree with the idea of if that landowner wants a honeydew, then you word it in differently. You can say, okay, I'm going to pay you, let's say, just to pull a number out of the air, we're paying this person a hundred dollars a rod and it's 10 rods to get across their property. And to rebuild the fence where we're paralleling is $2,000. You can divide that out into a per rod cost. And right. so you look at what it's going to take to get that right away. And if it's going to bump up more than that $2,000, it makes financial sense to say, okay, I'm going to add $2,000 to your check. And I've got ABC Fence Company over here that's willing to come and build your fence for that $2,000. So let's go ahead and I'm going to hand this over to you. You're just going to get paid. ABC Fence is ready to come. But it's up to you whether or not you hire them whenever that gets done. And that removes the liability from the company. And then a lot of times there's no shame in saying no. Mm -hmm. Some of these... Some landowners are going to ask for these creative solutions that literally move the needle on the budget for a project. And there's times where 
<laughs> that's not the right decision. And you just have to say, no, we can't do that. You're, you're taking too big a bite at the apple here. Right. And, and from the landowner standpoint, you really can't blame them. You know, they, they're trying to negotiate their best deal as well. And so it, you know, if you need these, as you call them, honeydews, <laughs> and you can get an oil and gas company to pay for them, uh, it, that's your, your strongest chance to negotiate there. I do want to talk about, um, you know, issues and to kind of get your per- perception on, you know, some, some things that you'll see on on the cleanup side of things and, and how to handle that. I, I, there's a lot of ways that you can handle the, the reseeding and the cleanup and stuff. But the, the thing that I'm curious is, is how, how do you think and how do you operate personally on issues of cleanup? So, for instance, depending on where you're working at, what this would come into play, but you mentioned working in Louisiana. Well, working in Louisiana, you might see a a contractor wanting to bury the stumps, which can, as you know, you know, later on tear up the right of way. Um, what do you think a right of way agent's responsibility is when they're negotiating for the easement to say, you know what, guys, we can get some good deals here, but we're gonna get some ill will if we don't handle the cleanup right. And so, how do you balance that aspect of making sure that you're not just taking care of the landowner? getting them a good um, a good fair price and working for your client with integrity but you're also you know you're not gonna get that phone call when the pipelines installed three months later goes hey man there's there's holes all up and down my right away and that's a matter of the internal communication with other departments you want to talk to the operation side and understand you know it, are we going to want to bury these stumps out there and then oftentimes if i know that ahead of time if the right away agent is aware that we have a contract they want to bear contractor they want to bury the stumps pretty much everybody that owns a fairly large piece of land has a hole they want to get filled up hmm. and we can sit there and negotiate with that landowner and say okay we're not going to bury the stumps on the easement that's going to cause integrity issues along the pipeline it's going to pothole the pop- pipeline in the future but what we can do is if you look right over here, about a thousand yards off the right of way, there's a patch where the trees haven't grown in and it's a real low spot. We're going to throw all the stumps over there, put a little dirt on top of it. And the landowner wants that they've signed off on it. They've accepted it. And by them signing off on it, it also eliminates the liability on the company of whenever those do start to rot and you get some potholes over there. I'm sorry, Jim, you, you agreed that this is what we we're going to do. We warned you this could happen. It's not, it's not on us. We already worked this out ahead of time. And it's just, you've got to have that internal communication. You have to sit down and be sure that you understand what every different department, what every different contractor is going to need in this project so that you can work that out with the landowner ahead of time and keep it from becoming an issue. Okay, let's change directions here just a little bit. Let's talk about the right away industry as a whole. People listen to this, they might say, you know what, um, right away sounds interesting or it sounds appealing. You know, what would you advise someone who's considering uh, getting a job as a right away agent? Um, you know, as far as maybe education or background or experience, what are some of the, 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 the ways that you would advise them on, um, you know, things to consider before they, they, they take on this career path? Before you take on the career path, there's a program at the University of Houston that's a right away certificate that will get you a base of knowledge. And also, one thing I've seen from good right away agents versus mediocre right away agents is whenever you get a job, look for a title job. Spend two, three years running title, learning title before you try to move into an actual you know, negotiating right away agent position. It's a building process and you've got to get those building blocks in place. And a lot of times I see companies now that they hire somebody that has that good personality that you want to put in front of a landowner and they try to skip learning those blocks and put them right in front of a landowner. And it tends to not work out very well. There's some who have succeeded at it, but I think it's more of a detriment to those than it's than those who have managed to succeed without it. Yeah, and I would just comment on that, and I would say the, the right of agents we've enjoyed working with, or me personally at least, work, working with are the ones who do have a very good grasp of title, um, and mainly because as a survey contractor, you know, we need, we're like, hey, this title is missing this, and we need this, um, you know, and, and, you know, the title 
rarely comes 100% complete just because, as you know, there's things that get overlooked. And, and so the, the, the right-of-way agents who have a title background, they're very understanding. Go, okay, yeah, this makes sense. Whereas, title or, uh, whereas a right-of-way agent who has no real title background, you get a lot of questions. Why do you need this? Is this important? And, and you know, it's like, well, yeah, we, we, we do need this. You should understand why we need this. And that it's, it's one of those things that um, can cause a cog uh, to, to slow down a project because, as you know, you're trying to go out there and close a um, a deal, um, and you need the plan to close the deal most of the time. And so, um, having the title background, I really I couldn't agree more. I think that is overlooked, and it really helps round out an agent, um, especially with dealing with other things that are going to come up later on down the road. It, that's true, and it is that on the job and training and certification. There's so many good programs through the IRWA for different certification levels. Mm-hmm. And even through the APL, the RPL CPL designation will help someone in the right of way field and on the surface side as well. And it's a matter of having gaining that knowledge as someone getting into the business to grow because there are three things that a right of way agent does that cost a company money. Number one is they send in an invoice for their time, they get paid. Mm-hmm. that's a given number two is the amount of time it takes them to complete a project because as things stretch out now that also pushes back contractors it pushes back in service dates and that costs the company money but there's also that third thing that's very different in right away that costs the company money and that's whenever they don't cover their bases in the easement they don't cover their bases in the title and things come up later they get attorneys involved and get the company involved over a document or over a title. And you've got to learn and understand right away so that you don't have those things come back later. Cause those are the things that will blackball a right away agent from being able to be hired by anyone because of a mistake that happened in the past. Okay. Now you mentioned you you went to law school. So I'm going to ask you a, a semi legal question and just a general thought pieces in, uh, in general. I'm curious options um options at one time were kind of a big thing and now it seems like a lot of a lot of companies are um, not really into you know buying using options um some people i've heard even said that it's not even permissible to do so what are your thoughts on options and um pros cons and, and just kind of curious your take on them in general options are still in use today by some companies and it depends on the definitive definitiveness of the project and so that's going to be a management call. If you have management that they feel that it is 80% sure that they're going to will, want to build a project, that they would like to have some of that money back. And if they do decide to go ahead with that project, well, they're going to be on a very short leash on an in-service date. Well, it would make sense to, okay, let's spend the money. Let's get the options. Let's start buying up these right away options so that, when management's ready to pull the trigger on this multi-million dollar project, we're not held up waiting on right of way. That's whenever an option makes sense. If you're sure that you're going to build this pipeline and you know, it's going to go into service, mm-hmm. an option does not make sense because once that option is executed, now a right away agent has to go back and actually follow through with the easement, the formal easement, getting the formal easement filed and, that also creates another cost center on the company. So it all depends on the certainty of building the project as to whether you would want to use that tool or not. Okay. So if you're saying, Hey, we're sitting around, we're looking at building this, you know, two, five, 10, 20, 30 mile job, whatever. Um, but we're not sure, but you know what? We want to go ahead and kind of get the boots on the ground. And, uh, that would be a time for options. Um, cause it's, it may, may not go, which, Hey, it's most projects in this business. They're like that. They may or may not go. But there is a lot, there, there's sometimes we say, you know what, we're going to build this thing. We know we're going to build it. In that scenario, you would not want to go out and look for options. Right. If you've got shippers that already have contracts on the pipeline, you're going to build it. Right. So why pay for right away to work on the project twice and get an option whenever you can just get the easements and go build? Right. Okay, well, Chris, this has been fantastic. Um, you obviously are very knowledgeable about the right away business, which is Wow, I was so glad when you reached out about coming on. Let's close this baby out with a couple things. Where can people find out, uh, connect with you, talk to you? You know, if they want to 
uh, you know, maybe ask questions or whatever uh, about that. Um, where you know, link the end or wherever you want to direct them to. And then secondly, um, is there anything we left out um, in the last minute or two that you wanted to kind of uh, cover before we get off here today? Well, Ryan, first off, I just want to say thank you for allowing me to be on your show. And after knowing you for half a decade, uh, I'm kind of really proud to see what you've done with yourself and uh, proud to see what you're doing in the industry. If, well, if somebody you. wants to get out, no, you're welcome. If somebody wants to get in touch with me, um, I do check my LinkedIn profile very often, and it's just linkedin.com forward slash cfails, F-A-I-L-S, or they can email me at chris at chrisfails.com. And then, of course, just give me a call, 956-489-6026. I'm currently working contract for an ENT company in, out of Houston right now, but that company is in the process of, They've done their teaser and they're setting up their VDR for a possible sale. So there is a chance that I'm going to be out there on the market soon. Hey, in this business, there's always a chance that we're always going to be in the <laughs> on the market soon. You know what? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you know, you feel like, man, we got the big project, and then, oh, no, it's not going to happen. And so, anyways, well, Chris, uh, we'll link to that in the show notes for people who want to check out uh, more about what you got going on and uh, connect with you. Thank you for your time today. I guess, you know, I haven't been to an IRA, IRWA event in a long time. I guess I need to, to get out there one day and uh, sit down. We can have lunch or something. That sounds great. I look forward to it. And to the listeners, thank you so much. Uh, be sure to check out the show notes. And until next time, keep fun.